Good evening, everyone. It is great to be here. I think the last time I spoke here at Foothills was 2002, but it was at the youth tent, since my ministry has been in youth ministries. Now, I guess, because my hair gets gray, I, I speak to uh, the older generation, not the youth. But it's great to be here representing the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. Greetings from Mark Johnson, from Paul Musafili, from Rose Jacinto, our under-treasurer, and from myself. We are glad to be serving our conferences across Canada. And that's the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada, to serve. Because the most important area to give service to is not the general conference, it's the local church and the classroom. And that's what we do at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. We work together. We're a different union. We're not like the other unions that have huge staff. We have very few. In fact, a lot of people here, um, like George Ali, serves on the ministerial council, the advisory. It's volunteer, but we do things to work to uh, give resources to our pastors across Canada. In 2020, we had a online virtual uh, convention for our pastors. Next year, in 2023, our pastors across Canada will be coming to Berman University for our face-to-face -face convention. First one since 2009. And we're looking forward to that. But greetings from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. It is great to be here. It is great to be a service. Uh, one of the most beautiful acts that I've ever seen Jesus do is when he took off his robe and he washed his disciples' feet. And as leaders, that's what we do. We want to make sure we serve uh, right down to our churches and to our schools because that's where the work of evangelism is done. It's not done in an office. It's done in the pew and in the classroom. And so we want to make sure we are giving resources, supporting them, and I really appreciate the administrative staff at the um, Alberta Conference. It's great to work with them. Uh, my counterpart is Wayne Williams, and I really enjoy working with Wayne. He's one of the few people that actually calls me just to see how I'm doing. Usually in, in ministry, um, everything's business within the church, and it's nice to talk to Wayne and he just calls up and says, Paul, I'm just calling just to see how you are doing. And I think that's very refreshing to have counterparts within the church today that look out for your well-being as we look out for each other. I want to talk today about uh, forging ahead. And we cannot do that. And as, as, as the Bible verse said, God will never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. But... I, I'm a strong, strong believer in prayer. And I want to tell a story. I'm going to tell a few stories today. I'm, I, I, I grew up in youth ministries. I appreciate that Jesus told stories all the time because we remember stories. If I wanted to go over 28 fundamental beliefs right now, some of you guys would get lost in the mumbo-jumbo and you wouldn't remember it. So that's why Jesus told stories so people could remember. And I love stories. Being in youth ministries, stories had a huge impact on young people. But I want to tell you a story going forward. Her name, some of you have, might have heard this story, but it's a story that means a lot to me because hearing this story as a kid, it built my faith in God, that he will never leave us or forsake us. In fact, when Jesus or angels showed up, what were the words they usually shared? Don't be afraid. You see, as Christians, we are really good at panicking. We love to panic. We like to look on the television. We like to hear things that get us into a panic mode. It gets us excited. But I want you to picture Jesus in the most holy place. He is not wearing out the carpet or whatever he's walking on because he's worrying. He's not there biting his nails. He's not wringing his hands. He has everything planned. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit know what's going to happen and they will give what is needed at the proper time. So there's a lady, her name was Helmi. She grew up in the country of Estonia. And um, as she was growing up, she married a wonderful seven-day Adventist man named Robert, and they decided to have kids. So by this time, they had had three kids. The Second World War was breaking out across Europe at that time. Robert spoke seven different languages, so 
they were wanting to protect the little country of Estonia, except they couldn't protect it from the large army of Russia or the large army of Germany. And so they um, formed a secret police force. Robert served on that secret police force. So they would intercept messages from Russia and intercept messages from the German army to figure out who was going to be there. Russia and Germany fought over Estonia. In fact, when the communist army came in, it was devastating to the people because Robert's parents were killed. Helmi's parents were also killed because they were just too old and nobody wanted to feed them, so they were shot by the communist soldiers. If you were a young teenage lady, it didn't bode well for you at that time. But Germany also wanted the country of Estonia, so they pushed the Russian army out and moved them out. And the Estonian people actually got along fairly well with the German army. Uh, they were very kind. Yes, there were a few people to, uh, that went missing. Uh, there was only about 9,000 Jewish people in the country of Estonia at that time, which is a very small number. And they disappeared. Nobody knew what happened to them. Nobody asked questions. But as the war raged on, um, Robert had to go out to sea. And when he was out to sea in the boat, he would intercept the, the airwaves that were coming in from Russia and also coming from Germany so they could figure out best how they could protect their country. Now remember, the Estonians were very favorable to the Germans. The Germans were actually quite favorable to the Estonians. They were very nice to them you would usually get a knock on the door in the evening to make sure your family was well by one of the German soldiers. And so the Estonians weren't too worried about the German army at that time. I know contrary to what we, we hear in the, you know, the history books, but at that time the Estonian people did not mind that. While Robert was at sea one day, the Germans knew that the boat that he was on was intercepting messages. And they sent a U-boat that direction off went a torpedo, and that boat blew up. There were no survivors. The night that it blew up, Helmi woke up in the middle of the night. She didn't know what woke her up, but all she knew when she woke up was that her husband was dead. Two weeks later, confirmation came that her husband had died at sea when that torpedo blew up his ship. The same night she woke up, but she knew her husband had died, but she knew that she would be okay. God was reassuring her. And it's in those times that we're going through very difficult times, God starts to pour out His peace into our lives. And that's what was happening with Helmi. But Helmi was saying to the Lord, He said, Lord, I don't want to raise my kids in a communist country. And if Russia comes back and invades our country, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to raise the three kids that I have to know you. So Lord, would you provide a way out for us? Would you provide a way out for us to get out of the country? So as the um, war was going on, the city of Tallinn was receiving you know, aerial bombardment. And so housing was in a shortage. Helmi lived in a three-bedroom apartment. And some German officers came to her uh, one day and said, Helmi, you're going to have to move you and your three kids into one of your bedroom and rent out the other two bedrooms. We don't have anywhere to put some of our staff. And so Helmi gave up her apartment, basically, for two ladies that worked for the German High Command. Now, that was actually a very good thing. Because when the German High Command um, did anything, Helmi got extra rations. And so the two ladies that were working for the German High Command were also dating German officers. So when the German officers came over, sometimes they brought butter, sometimes they brought eggs, sometimes they brought flour, and sometimes, if, you, if things were really good, they brought extra sugar. So Helmi did not mind giving up her apartment because it, made, uh, it, it gave her food for her and her three kids. And she was very thankful for that. One day, the German soldiers came to her, the, the officers that were dating the two ladies, and they said, Helmi, is there any way you can get yourself out of the country because we cannot hold on? We are losing, we, we, we are just overextended on too many fronts, and we're losing the war on so many fronts. Uh, you need to get out of this country because the communist soldiers will come in and they're going to stay here for good when they do invade. It says, if there's any way for you to get out, to take a boat to Sweden, get there. Helmi had no means. She was very poor, you know, since her husband was gone. 
She had nothing to, to help her to, to get to another country or anything like that. So Helmi did what she knew best to do, which was pray. She went to church and she told everybody, she said, guys, we need to get out of the country. And, and the pastor was on board. The other members were on board. And then one particular Sabbath that she was at church, the pastor said, listen, there's a boat leaving, I mean a train leaving next week to one of the port cities in Germany. We can take the train and then we can get on a boat to Sweden. And so Helmi said, fantastic. That's what I've been praying for. When does this train leave? And the pastor said, next Sabbath. Well, Helmi scratched her head and she said, pray that your flight is neither in winter nor on the Sabbath. So when she went back to church next Sabbath, there was only her and a few other people. Everybody had taken that train out. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to take a train on the Sabbath or anything like that, but for Helmi at that time, she said, Lord, I don't know why you wrote that, but I'm going to believe that. Because God comes through in trying times. God comes through when we have nothing that we can depend on ourselves. When we have exhausted everything that we can do, God will come through. Sometimes when people take the easy way out, they might not have the story to go with it. But when people say, Lord, I'm trusting you, they will have an amazing story. So Helmi started to pray. The soldiers told her and said, Helmi, we're, we won't be able to hold on to the city for another week, so you need to get out of here fast. And so all week long, Helmi prayed. When it came down to Thursday morning, she woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning, had no idea what to do, and she said, I'm going to go walk the streets and pray. She loved to pray and walk. And so that's what she did early in the morning, going out on the streets of Tallinn. She went walking the cobblestone streets, praying, said, Lord, please, I cannot raise my kids in a communist country. Could you please provide a way out for me? I have nowhere to turn. I don't know what to do. In fact, that's why I'm here, Lord, on the streets, because I don't know what to do. At this early morning, she sees a lady dressed in gray walking the other side of the street. And as the lady dressed in gray walking the other side of the street, she crosses over right to Helmi, calls her by name, says, Helmi, you and your three kids need to get out of the country, don't you? And she goes, yes. Listen, if you go down to the docks, at the end of dock number B, there's a boat there. Go down to the dock with your kids and you will be on that boat. Helmi's mouth is just dropping open at that time because who is this lady that's talking to her? So Helmi, in her excitement, turns around and says, I forgot to say thank you, and turns back around and the lady's gone. She runs home, wakes up the kids and says, God, kids, pack whatever we had. They had packed little suitcases and, and stuff like that, but they, they needed to put a little bit more clothing in there. And their suitcases were small, not these big huge suitcases that we have now, but little tiny ones. So her and her three kids, her, her youngest was Elika, she was eight. Her other daughter, Esther, was nine. And then there was Joel, that was 14. And all four of them were running down to that dock number B. Now, remember, um, her husband Robert was a merchant marine. He had worked in the sailing industry all of his life. Helmi knew every single boat that came into the harbor of Tallinn. She knew everything. And as they rounded the, uh, one of the hills, to, went down to where the port was, she saw the boat at the end of Dock B because she knew all the docks. And her heart uh, jumped for joy because she knew who captained that boat. But as they ran down there, the four of them, and they ran over the hill, all of a sudden their mouth dropped open because this boat that held around 500 people comfortably, maybe 900 with no luggage when it's the last boat out, but there was 5,000 people waiting to get on that boat. 5,000. And Helmi's heart just sank, and she said, Lord, you sent that lady to tell me I would get on that boat. What am I going to do? And just as she says, what am I going to do? Her little daughter Esther says, Mom, you see that building over by side, dock number B? Let's go around that building and we can get in front of half the people. And Hel um, Helmi looks at Esther and says, great idea. And so they ran down around the building and as they're running around the building, all of a sudden they came to a complete stop because there was eight feet of water separating them from the dock B. And Helmi said, Lord, 
could you please help us get across? As she was praying in her head, she felt a large hand on her shoulder, and she looked up to see this incredibly tall German soldier going, Ma'am, what can I do to help you? And Helmi says, we need to get on that side. He goes, no problem at all. I'm going to throw you guys across. So he picked up little Elika and whipped her across. <laughs> she tumbled on the other side, but she was safe. Picked up Esther and threw her across. Picked up Joel. Joel was a 14-year-old teenager. He was a little bit heavy and threw him across. Helmi was a much larger lady. Helmi said, how is this guy going to get me across? So she did what she knew how to do, closed her eyes and prayed. Lord, help him to be able to throw me across. And when she opened her eyes, she was on the other side. She looked back to see that German soldier and he was gone. They had 2,500 people behind them and 2,500 in front of them. Helmi said, Lord, you parted the Red Sea because, guys, these stories that we hear from our childhood on impregnate in us the, the trust in God. And she said to God, God, like you split the Red Sea many years ago, could you move these people out of the way? Now, this could have been the last boat that was leaving that port city. People don't move out of the way for somebody else to get on the boat that they're trying to get on to. But as they walked, they let Helmi go for uh, not Helmi, but um, Elika go first, the smallest. And as Elika, Esther, Joel, and Helmi walked, the crowds moved out of the way. When they got to where the uh, gangplank was, there were ropes, German soldiers, and guard dogs preventing people from getting on. And so Helmi put under, under one of them in there, and the German soldier pushed it back. The guard dogs were barking. She tried another place. She was pushed back. The guard dogs were block, uh, barking. So she did what she knew how to do again. She prayed. And she said, Lord, in the Word of God, You said You had blinded soldiers and prevented them from seeing. Could You do the same for us so that my family of four can get on that boat? So she got the kids together. She says, duck underneath the rope. Don't ask any questions. Get on the boat. Just say you're going for your parents and get on there. Elika ducks underneath the rope. Now, an eight-year-old could get by, but the guard dogs did not bark. Not a single soldier looked at her. Elika gets up onto the gangplank, walks on. Esther follows her doing exactly the same thing and gets onto the gangplank and onto the boat. Joel does the same thing and then Helmi ducks underneath the rope. Not a single bark from a dog and not a single soldier pushing her back. As she got on there, she hugged the kids and all of a sudden she hears, Helmi! Helmi! And she turns around and she sees the captain's wife. The captain comes, uh, captain's wife comes over and says, Helmi, go down to the bottom of the boat. There's no room down there. But just wait. We'll make an announcement and there'll be room. Once there's room, get on there and don't get off this boat. Whatever you do, don't get off the boat. You see, the boat was heading for Sweden. But as they went downstairs, it was crowded. People were in their little berths and the areas, and they had their life's possessions. Huge trunks taking up room where people could be on. And so they heard an announcement over the PA system saying that this boat is no longer going to Sweden, it's going to Germany. People looked at themselves and they said, we don't want to go to Germany. We need to go to Sweden. We want to go to a neutral country. And so they started to take their suitcases, their baggage, their boxes off the boat. And within half an hour, the bottom of the boat had been um, decluttered enough. So Helmi and her three kids took a little berth. They put their stuff at the back there and they waited and they waited and they waited. They heard the engines rev to power. And Helmi waited for about half an hour after she heard the engines rev. And when she could feel the boat rocking enough, she knew that they were going out into the Baltic Sea and that they were out far enough from the city of Tallinn. Her and her three kids ran upstairs to see the captain's wife. And the captain's wife said, Helmi, we had to tell everybody we were going to Germany so we could lighten the boat so we could take 
people who needed to get out of the country, not trying to get their riches out of the country, but trying to save themselves. You see, when Helmi got on that boat, that was the last boat that left the port city of Tallinn under German control. The Russians invaded the very next day. And for many, many years, they stayed in control of the country of Estonia. Why this story is so important is because Helmi used to tell me that story when I would be on her knee. Uh, I was a lot smaller back then. Helmi's my grandmother. Esther's my, my mother. And I, I, I would listen to that story, especially on Friday evening, as my grandmother would tell me that story, as my mom would tell me that story, just, just telling me how God led when there was no possible way for, for us in our own power to do something, God provided. And my, my mom, my aunt, my uncle, and my grandmother became refugees in Sweden. Then to move to Australia to learn English, and from Australia back to Sweden, and from Sweden to Canada. People, we have a God that provides. In the book of Daniel, there's, there's three men that are, are threatened with death into the fiery furnace. Now people, if there's any way to die, fire's not one of them that I would want to ever experience myself. But those three men were told to bow down or be thrown into the fiery furnace, and they said, no, we're not. We're going to serve our God. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and we know those stories because they're so meaningful to us and to our kids. And, and instead of three of them being in the fiery furnace, Jesus shows up with them. You see, people, we're never alone. No matter what we go through on this earth, we are never alone. Jesus is with us. And so three of them came out. But the story that I love the most in the book of Daniel is the story of Daniel. In fact, we named our son after Daniel, the prophet Daniel. I love that story because Daniel is very silent in most of that story. While those, you know, 120 set traps and governors and and, and, and mayors and all that stuff were scheming to get a job, the highest job, and that's human nature, people. We are always trying to raise ourselves. We're always trying to put somebody else down and raise ourselves to a higher area. And that's what they were doing. They didn't like Daniel. They knew that this guy was a different guy. They knew he was one of the Jews and they didn't like him very well. And they said, hey, listen, guys, we know the king likes him. And when the king likes him, we know that he's going to become the head of us. So we have to find something wrong with him. And so they looked to find whatever they could wrong with him, and they couldn't find anything. So they went to the king, and they buttered up the king. They got the king to think of himself. And when the king was thinking highly of himself, they said, well, why don't you make a law that nobody prays to any other god but you for an entire month? And he said, yeah, that's a good idea. Fantastic. Guys, why didn't I think of that? And he puts it into law. And of course, Daniel, Daniel being the guy that he is, being the follower of God that he is, being the prayerful man that he is, doesn't change his routine. And you could just picture all the people running over there, the other set traps, the other, the other governors that, that wanted Daniel to be killed, running over there, watching him open up his, his blinds, his, his uh, curtains, whatever he had there, and start praying. Could you imagine how fast they took out their cell phones to take pictures back then? Well, they didn't. Maybe they were putting a cuneiform tablet together. But as human nature goes, word spread fast. Some of them ran back to the king. They said, oh, king, you know you made that law. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I made that law. Yep, yep. Whole month, nobody can pray to anybody else but me. Um, Well, we found somebody that has been praying to his God. And the king said, oh, remember, I stamped it in. That guy must die. And then all of a sudden they said, it's Daniel. And the blood just left his head. Almost to the point of fainting when he realized that somebody had conspired against Daniel, his most trusted servant. He gets his biggest lawyers to work on it all day long. And as they're working on it all day long and trying to get Daniel off the hook, Daniel is amazingly silent during this whole time. 
You see, if it was happening to me, I would be on my computer making sure I was vindicated, making sure I had done enough tweets, enough Facebook um, posts to make sure everybody knew how bad uh, the thing was that was going to happen to me, how bad the king was, how bad the people that conspired against me. I would be spreading it wide. But Daniel did what a godly person does. He didn't meddle in it. He knew his God would be faithful to take care of him. Even if Daniel died, even if Daniel died, laid down his life in the lion's den, he was willing to go there for his God. You see, people, one day on the earth made new, three million years from now, isn't that bizarre? We, three million years from now, on the earth made new, under the tree of life, some of us are going to be sitting and we're going to try to look back at our 78 to 80 years of our life, hopefully Methuselah's not there, and say how important was that little blip on the radar screen of eternity when all of the glory of heaven is going to be before us. The glory of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit is going to be there. And, and people, it's not going to be big at all. Whatever we have gone through on this earth, how terrible it seems on this earth, Remember, the Bible says, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. So all that we've gone through on this sin-laden planet, God is going to take care of us in heaven. He is going to repay all that we went through. That, that just blows me away, people. So why do we try to control life so much on this earth? Why when something happens, we try to do this? Why when something happens, we go to our posts and we try to do that? We try to Twitter it out and all that stuff. We try to do something to change the way things are going instead of being silent like Daniel and doing what God has asked us to do. I'll share a little bit of that tomorrow uh, during our main service. People, we get so paranoid we get so frazzled. We worry so much when God is in control. My mom and I, I had a brother. Um, uh, my brother in 2019 passed away. But growing up with my brother, my brother early on became an alcoholic. And uh, we lived totally different lives. My brother went that way, I went this way. And as life was going on, life was not too good for my brother because he was starting to drink more and more and more. My mom and I were worried about him, very worried. My dad couldn't care less because my dad was in a similar boat as my brother. But as we were worrying away, we were seeing that my brother was getting deeper and deeper into alcoholism. So my mom and I prayed more and more. One day my mom called me and said, Paul, I have bad news. I said, what is it? He said, Rob's been in a serious accident. He nearly killed a lady and he was driving drunk. And I said, oh, no. Lord, we're asking you to save him, not to destroy his life. But God is so patient, even with our challenges, even with our, you know, getting mad at God at times, going, why are you doing it this way, God? You should do it this way. I know better. And God says, move out of the way. Let me do what I do best. And so my mom and I would pray for my brother. We were saying, look, look, what's going on here? He went to court. He was sentenced to three months in jail. Now, today's day and age, he would probably be sentenced to nine years in jail. But he was sentenced to three months. And I said, Lord, that's not helping my brother. What are you doing? And the Lord whispered back, Paul, move out of the way. Let me do what I have to do. So I said, God, you do what you have to do. I'm going to stand back and let you take care of my brother. So my brother's sentenced to three months in jail. His first night in jail, my brother makes me look small, made me look small. I'm the tall one. He was the big one. When he passed away, I don't say this in jest, it took seven gentlemen to carry him out to the van. He was big, very big. And so there he is in jail. And when my brother snored, you heard, in fact, if he snored here, we would hear it on the other end of camp at night. It was loud. The whole building would shake when he would snore. 
So the next morning, my brother was staying in a jail where it was a community jail. You didn't have rooms or anything. Everybody stayed in, in, in uh, you know, beds lined up and all that stuff. Two Hell's Angels came over to Robert the next morning and said, Robert, is that you snoring at night? He goes, yeah, I'm a really bad snorer. Sorry about that. They said, Rob, if you snore tonight, we're going to slice your throat while you're snoring. Well, that night, Robert did not snore at all. In fact, he did not sleep at all. He said, I'm going to stay awake all night long. By the way, my brother Robert was named after my grandfather, if you haven't noticed. He's going to, I'm going to sleep uh, during the day, and I'm going to stay awake all night long. And so that night, he said, oh, I can do this. Yes, I can do this. No, no problem. But the next day, when he was supposed to sleep during the day, he couldn't get any sleep there because things were too busy. And so the next night, he was struggling to keep awake. Wake. Then the next night, he was just ready to fall asleep. And he said, Lord, I don't want to die in this jail. You see, my brother had not prayed for probably about 15 years. But in that jail, he literally got out of his bunk onto his knees and he said, Lord, I'm going to die here unless you do something to get me out of jail. So he managed to stay awake that night in the morning Word got down through the guards that Robert had an appointment with the warden. So one of the guards came down and says, Rob, you're going to go see the warden. He goes, what about? He goes, I have no idea, but he wants to see you right now. So Robert marched down to where the warden was. When he got to the warden's office, he went in, and the warden said, Rob, I hear there's a death threat on you. He goes, yes, there is. He says, I hear it's from the Hell's Angels. He goes, yes it is. And he says, they actually mean it. Those guys would do whatever they threaten to you. He goes, I don't like people dying in my jail. So Rob, I'm going to talk to you very seriously. Rob, you're an alcoholic, aren't you? And Rob goes, yes I am. He goes, I have a friend who is a counselor. Rob, I have the power to parole you right now, but if I do, you have to guarantee me you will go see her twice a week and you will follow the protocols that she lays out and you will stay dry during that entire time. If you choose not to, you're staying here for three months and you'll probably die here. If you choose to follow the instructions I give but mess up, you will come back in here for six months and you will die here. I said, Rob, what's your choice? He goes, I want to go see her for counseling. So Rob went to her office for counseling. He didn't know that she was a Christian counselor. The warden was a God-fearing person and sent Rob to a Christian counselor. And the entire time Rob was there getting counseling for his alcoholism, she said, Rob, there is the higher power of Jesus and you need to grab hold of Jesus or else nothing's going to happen. A few months later, my brother was baptized. I don't know if anybody knows Jim Ryan, but Jim Ryan was the one that baptized my brother. My brother, big man, little Jim Ryan, baptizing him. But people, that tells me that God takes care of us. That tells me that God takes care of us. And when I go through those stories, when you go through those stories, when you go through those life events where you see God coming through, Know He is taking care of your life. Know that He will never leave you or forsake you. Know that even the smallest details of your life are in His hands. One more story. Do you guys mind stories? Okay. Sorry, I I like telling stories. Tomorrow night I will tell a few more. Tomorrow is going to be more uh, for church, more biblical and things like that. But I like telling stories because people when we remember the way that God has led in the past, it helps us when we're going forward to trust Him even more when everything else falls out from our feet and we have nothing to stand on anymore. My wife and I were living in Oshawa, Ontario, and I had just taken a position with the Maritime Conference to be a pastor in Digby, uh, New Minas, and Middleton. It was a large district, straight line right across. Not three churches in a triangle, straight line right across. I drove a Camry. I said to my wife one day, uh, as we were getting ready for bed, I said, Sonia, 
Mike, the Camry uses a lot of gas. I think I need a more efficient Yaris to take us around. And by the way, why I like Yaris is, is because it's a car that's small that big people can get into. So I said to my wife, I would like a little tiny Yaris. And Sonia said to me, she said, Paul, wait, if we trade in the car right now for a little Yaris, we're going to have to pay out quite a few thousands of dollars because you will always lose money on a trade-in. And she said, drive the car till it bites the dust and then we'll get a little tiny Yaris for you. And we won't be out laying out so much money. I said, no problem. But Sonia, why don't we just pray about it? So my wife and I prayed, said, Lord, if you want us to have a more fuel-efficient car like a little Yaris, that's in your hands. So a week went on. I had, was preaching in Toronto at a church. I was working at the Ontario Conference at that time. And I came home, and it was alumni weekend for Kingsway. And I said, Sonia, let's all go for alumni weekend. And she said, Paul, I've had the kids all morning at church. It's your turn. She said, take them to alumni weekend. I said, kids, we're going to alumni weekend. And of course, the kids just rolled their eyes at me. And so I let my wife rest at home. My kids and I went in our, our Camry down. We lived about 20 minutes north of Kingsway College. And as we were making our way down, I could see as we were going down, because we were on a, a plateau, Kingsway College was, or Osha was down here, I could see storm clouds rolling across the, the sky. As those storm clouds were coming closer, uh, as, and I neared Kingsway College, and I pulled onto the property of Kingsway College right by College Park Elementary School, where I used to work. And as I pulled down there, the rain unleashed on our car, on the ground around us. And it wasn't just one of those, uh, you know, rainstorms where, you know, you get a little bit of rain. It poured. By the time I had reached the end of uh, College Park Elementary, I was going through about that much water because so much rainwater was coming down. I had my windshield wipers on full, and I was only going about 10 to 15 kilometers an hour just so I could see the road. Out of nowhere, our car lights up all around us as lightning hits the hood of my car. And it was literally light all around us. I whipped my head around to the kids, and my kids are just wide-eyed. I said, kids, are you okay? They said, yeah, what just happened? I said, kids, we just got struck by lightning because my car horn was now blaring at full volume. I tried turning on the lights, I tried the turn signal, I tried everything else. Nothing else worked, but my engine was sputtering. <laughs> so I, I managed to, to, to drive it in a controlled stall all the way into the parking lot of Kingsway College. I tried turning off the car, it wouldn't turn off. So I called on their cell phone to Sonia's dad and said, could you bring some tools here? I need to dis, dis, uh, take off the battery. I got out in the rain and I just walked over to the horn and I just pulled the wires right out because we couldn't stand the deafening noise of this horn. My father-in-law came and I dislocated the battery cables. I then got out my phone and my insurance card and I called the insurance company. It got connected to a, a call center in Newfoundland and I said, hey, really glad to talk to you. I've had an incident with my car. It's not working. They said, what happened? I said, it was struck by lightning, and she starts laughing. And I said, no, 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 really, it got struck by lightning. She goes, oh, you're not joking. So we got arrangement for a tow truck to come and to take my car to the Toyota dealership. It was dropped off there on that Saturday night. Monday morning, I go over to the dealership because our insurance um, adjuster was going to be there too. He looked at the car and he said, Paul, I'm going to crunch the numbers I'll get back to you tomorrow of what we're going to give you for the car. He said, your car cannot be uh, given to a junkyard. It has to be melted down. Every single wire is fused together because of the lightning. Your car has a special tag on it that it cannot be sold for any parts. It must be melted down. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's, that's terrible. He said, I'm amazed that you guys lived through this. You could see where the lightning hit the, 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 the hood, and you could see where the lightning came out the tires because of so much water on the road. So I, he leaves, and the manager for the Toyota dealership in Bowmanville, Ontario, there said, Paul, come to my office. I'm going to tell you the blue book value of your car. 
because insurance companies usually don't give you the value for the car that's needed. And I said, okay. So he went there and he said, looked up at my car, the make, and you know, well, not the make, but the model of it. And he said, your car, don't take anything less than $9,000 because that's what we would be able to sell your car for, you know, marked up and all that stuff. So if the insurance company comes back with anything less than $9,000, you say blue book value is $9,000. The next day, the insurance adjuster called. And he said, Paul, your car was in very good shape. And I noticed that you had brand new tires on it. We're going to give you $600 just for your tires. And we're giving you $11,000 for the car. So my wife and I went to the Toyota dealership and they said, what can we get for this? And he said, we just happened to have a Yaris come in on lease. And so my time there, as I traveled around Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, I drove in this little tiny small car that people would laugh when I would get out because they couldn't believe that a big man could fit in a small car like that. But people, Sonia and I prayed for a Yaris. And God came through. Even the minor details of this earthly life, God takes care of us. We just need to pray. And people, when God does not come through the way we want that prayer answered, know that He is taking care of it the best way possible. Know that His way is always better than our way. Because when I was praying about my brother and I was questioning God, why are you doing this? God said, step out of the way. I'm going to take care of it, Paul. God is amazing. God will not let us down. Everything we bring before the Father is put in the incense burner in the holy place that wafts into the most holy, into the mercy seat where Jesus ministers on our behalf. Even if we die, our prayers are still there wafting around before the throne of God. Never to depart from that throne room Know that Jesus is concerned for us. He's engraven us on the palms of his hands. He knows the hair numbers of our hair, and I'm losing more and more, but he knows that. He loves us. We're the apple of his eye. So people, if we're his children, trust God that he is going to take care of you like his child. And even if we lose our life or we have to go into the grave because we have been waiting for the second coming and it hasn't happened, even if we go into the grave, know that he will call your name on the resurrection. We have nothing to worry about in this world. As long as we put our lives, the lives of our families, the lives of our children into his hands and trust him. Would you pray with me at this time? Dear Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. We are your children and you love us dearly. Lord, so many of us have burdens on our heart. It might be health, it might be family, it might be finances. But Lord, whatever we're going through, even the smallest details of our lives are taken care of by you. So Lord, provide not for our benefit, but for our spiritual, eternal life's benefit. So that we can tell these stories to other people before you come back. And they will hear those stories about how you have led in our lives. And they will want the same God in theirs. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, everybody can hear us? Hey, that's more like it. There we go. Oh, they can okay. hear us. We have sound. Uh, Right. Hello, everybody. My name is Pastor Jordan Smith, and to my right, we have... Pastor David Hamstra. And then to my left, we have... Paul Llewellyn. Welcome, welcome. Pastor Paul, you just preached a wonderful sermon. Mm. And um, so after the camp meeting sermon in the main auditorium, we're just going to be having some time to answer your questions, interact with you, and um, if you have any questions for Pastor Paul about the sermon that was just preached, you can put them in the comments right now and we'll get to them later. So we look forward to seeing your questions in the comments. Absolutely. All right. Let's get underway. Yes. We have a question for, uh, well, really everybody, Okay. but we'll start with it. 
What was the main takeaway you got from the message? You want to go for your story? For, for me or for Pastor Paul? Well, I was preaching it, so I have many takeaways from <laughs> yeah. it. So. What, what, but if you had one thing from the message that you want to make sure that everybody got, what would you say that was? Even our uh, smallest details of our lives, God's going to take care of it. Amen. Even the smallest details of our lives, God's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go off script. Go for it. I have a story. Mm -hmm. Sure. So it was summer of 2017, and I got a phone call mm. from a, um, a Haitian man who asked me about the 1844 General Conference and Righteousness by Faith. <laughs> 1888. 1888. Yeah. 1888, sorry. 1888 General Conference and Righteousness by Faith. Cool. And at that time, I could answer all of the questions that he had for me. Yeah. And good. I had no clue what this was about. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks later, I got a call from you inviting right. me to um, pastor in the Maritime Conference. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And now, when I went to the Maritime... Not just pastor in the Maritime Conference, pastor an entire province. Yes, pastor an entire province, Prince Edward Island. If anybody from Prince Edward Island is watching, hi! <laughs> yeah. When I um, accepted, I didn't really own anything. You know, mm. I was fresh out of school, and I went back home, I owned nothing. But I got on the plane to Moncton with like three duffel bags of clothes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and I got picked up. Uh, I met all of the people at the conference, mm -hmm. signed the papers, and I literally didn't even have a potato peeler. And I'm going to Prince Edward Island, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, what they do is potatoes. And, and I don't even have a potato peeler. <laughs> and That's Anne good. of Green Gables. Yes. And <laughs> Anne of Green Gables, but <laughs> more potatoes. Yeah, potatoes. Right. A lot. <laughs> That's why I'm as big as I am. I ate potatoes growing up. <laughs> a lot. We thought that the car might get cold. That night, so. <laughs> and the next, the next day, which was the Friday before the Sabbath, I was to be installed. Sure. I went around looking for an apartment, and um, I found one that I surprisingly could afford. And I signed the lease, and I moved in the Sunday after I was installed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Wild story. When I went up. Uh, to the apartment, I saw that my apartment was number seven. And I was like, oh, that's cute. Mm -hmm. And as I walked in, it wasn't an audible voice, but I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, this will be a place of rest for you. Yes. And I was so scared because I had never been a pastor before. Mm -hmm. I had never lived on my own before. Mm -hmm. I had never owned a car before. Mm -hmm. And all of these small little details God was putting it mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And I had to forge ahead yep. before I saw any of it come together. That's right. That's right. And yeah. it's 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 so true that even the tiniest thing in our life, God is taking care of us. Down to a thing. potato peeler. Down to a <laughs> potato peeler. That's Would it. you believe it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went um to a speaking engagement the following Sabbath and you know what I was gifted? What? A potato. <laughs> that's so good. Because the knife just won't cut it. Yeah, that's Sorry. right. That's that's right. A, that was a dad joke. That was a dad joke, just for the record. Um, no, what your stories put me in mind of is the book of Esther, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, famously never mentions God, right? Mm -hmm. that, that is never explicitly mentioned in this book mm -hmm. of the Bible. Yet all these coincidences just happen to line up, right? Yeah. So that God's people can be saved. Yep. Yeah. Now, well, who's doing this? Right. Mm -hmm. The answer is obvious. Sometimes you don't even need to say it. Mm -hmm. yeah. God is in those coincidences. Right? But but not just in the story of protecting Esther and God's people. It's so that other people can see this because Esther's story went far and wide. Daniel's story went far and yeah. wide. Mm -hmm. Daniel didn't do anything to promote himself, and yet his yeah. story was front pages for the next few weeks. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're still waiting for your comments to come in. Maybe we can just do a little YouTube tutorial for those who may not know, right? Yes. Because you might not know how to make a comment on YouTube. And we'll be here um, hopefully every night of camp meeting so you can interact. 
Um, if you're watching it on your little iPad or, or phone or something, you just tap that button um, that gives you the, the comments. Uh, it's just below where the video is going to be, mm -hmm. and you can pull it up and where it says chat publicly, you just tap and you, you write your comment. If you're on your computer, well, just scroll down. Scroll down below the video and you can use your keyboard and you, know, you can talk with us. But otherwise, we're happy to talk with each other. Um, I like the Ellen White quote that you brought out. Uh, I, I don't know that you quoted it directly, right? But you were paraphrasing uh, what she had to say there. Yes. Uh, we have nothing to fear for the future, mm -hmm. except, and, and I'm probably going to paraphrase it now as well. Yep. <laughs> as, as we as we uh, forget God's leading in, in our the past. past. That's right. Right. Um, there is something important about the not just the studying of world history, but the rehearsing of our personal histories, yeah. the histories of our communities, mm -hmm. of our churches, yeah. and highlighting how God was involved. Yeah. This gives us a, a confidence and assurance facing the future that is very attractive to mm -hmm. people around us. Right. Yeah. Uh, it is something when, when we can look on the future, even though it seems uncertain, with a sense of peace. Even yeah. if we may have some anxieties, we have a sense of peace. Um, the people look at that and say, wow, how, how is that happening? How are you doing that? Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. then they want to, you have a chance to share your stories right. of God, your testimony yeah. of God. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And, and, you know, look look at all the people groups across this world that have made it through awful, awful times. Like, you know, I, I'm a history buff. Uh, I, I, I do have a degree in history on top of it. But I like uh, Vietnam War and, mm -hmm. you know, the Laos and the other countries that went through it. Sure. How do you know? How did people live through the Pol Pot regime? Mm -hmm. Regime yet God took care of people, yes, even through the most awful times right. when humanity gets totally crazy, and yet God still preserves people through that uh, mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I have a question. Please. And this is a question for those of us. My question is, with the awareness that God is taking care of even the smallest things. Mm -hmm. And with our memory of what God has done for us in the past. We, we, sorry, we just have a commenter who's noted that your microphone is off, Jordan. Oh no. So I'm just alerting our sound guy here. I'm gonna turn it on. There we go. Hello, Hopefully can you? People can hear you better now. Hopefully. Okay, <laughs> right. please carry on. <laughs> okay, with the awareness that God is taking care of even the little things, and with remembering how God has taken care of us in the past. What are you looking forward to? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've, I have certain callings of God in my life. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, one of them, I'm sort of wondering how I'm going to make it, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I, you said I have a degree in history. That's not quite true. I finished the coursework for a doctoral <laughs> degree in history. I still need to do my exams. I still need to defend my dissertation proposal. Mm -hmm. I still need to write a dissertation and defend it, right? Mm -hmm. those, those, are, those are, you know, hurdles that, that need yeah. to be accomplished. Uh, and, 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 and thankfully, I, I have a loving church family in uh, the Edmond Central Seventh Avenue Church. And they're telling me, uh, my elders are telling me, Pastor, how are you going to take time to study and, and finish your degree program? That's a, that's a blessing. That is a blessing. You know? But, you know, I am, I am looking forward to that. And at the same time, I'm looking forward to how God is going to help me overcome those hurdles, right? Because uh, now that we're hopefully coming out of this, this cycle of shut down, open up, shut down, open up mm -hmm. with our churches, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about, saints. Uh, we can begin to, to build up some rhythms that are conducive to productivity. Yeah. Right? Not just in our personal life, but, but in, our, in our public life, in our, in our churches. You know, get back into these cycles of evangelism that we need to be doing and, uh, and that sort of thing. So I'm really looking forward to having um, some stability, hopefully, uh -huh. for a little while. I think God is going to provide us with some of that. It looks like time is going to be extended here so that we can finish the work that he's given each of us to do in this world before Jesus comes. I hope that's a reasonable answer. You're looking at me now, Jordan? Yes. Do you want me to go next? Sure, I can speak because I can speak long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, what little thing am I looking forward? Yes. Uh, for God doing? Um, changing us so that we are no longer... Our, our whole church, I and mean, I, I say this with trepidation, we have good programs like church services, mm -hmm. and we have good buildings. Yeah, but we're we're not really good for reaching the communities. And mm. I, I want to see our communities reach. That our church is the most uh, 
wonderfully annoying presence in our communities. Mm -hmm. That we're always there. We're there for when people die. We're there when people mm -hmm. get married. We're there. We're there to give them a, a, a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. But we, I want our churches to be a church that is so known in the community that. Um, whenever they think of Christianity, they think of a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm. And I, I want to get us away from our, our thing of taking care. We, we do so well in our church service and in our building, but we really lack reach in the community. And I, I can't wait to see us uh, move to that point where we reach to our, reach out to our communities, even if it's small things. And we don't have to do the community around our church. It's where I live. Mm -hmm. My neighborhood, I can share Christ there without even mentioning Christ's name. I can mow my neighbor's lawn. I can shovel my... Um, Mavis lives across from me. Mavis is a nurse. Sometimes she has to leave early in the morning. Yeah. We have some snowstorms in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, Mavis comes out and her driveway is done. And I'm not doing that for my glory, just mm -hmm. so that I have talking points with Mavis. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's wonderful. I like that expression you used. Wonderfully annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, may I steal that? <laughs> More than welcome. <laughs> yep. Okay, Jordan, back to you. And then what I am I looking? Yeah. I'm honestly, guys, you guys were looking forward to some really big, amazing, wonderful things. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to getting a new car, yeah. maybe a new house, yeah. all of the, like, the little things that I think are not that important that I know God wants me to have safety and transportation mm -hmm. to yeah. do the things that he's called me to do so i'm looking forward to those to those little things as well but also the big things that god's doing in my ministry i'm very excited about that mm -hmm. and you know what else i'm looking forward to the unexpected mm -hmm. things that i just was not expecting but god just decided hey i'm gonna bless you with this yeah. today cool. i'm looking forward to receiving that amen Jordan has a testimony that she can share with us at some point later this week. We, I do. I some we At some point tonight. in the week, I will share, but we don't have time tonight. But we want to thank you so much for um, spending some time with us tonight, um, watching online our... Um, our service with Pastor Llewellyn, who preached such a wonderful sermon. And we want to remind you that even in the smallest things, God is watching out for you. Yeah. Amen. We'll see you folks tomorrow night and hopefully every night throughout this camp meeting. Thank you for bearing with us in our technical difficulties. We're trying to get this up and running. This is our first time. So uh, we just want to uh, have a maybe a quick prayer right now. Uh, and Pastor Paul, maybe you could bless us as we, as we sign off here. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dearly Father, help us to learn to trust you in even the smallest things. Even if we're pulling out in a busy road, Lord, and all of a sudden all the cars are not there and mm -hmm. you open up that to go out. That is a blessing from you. And Lord, I pray that we will start recognizing those small, little blessings and start thanking you for it. Because when we start, start thanking you for those little blessings, we start to see the bigger ones in our lives every day. So Lord, be with us as a people and as we trust you more. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.